Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of All Things MSP Podcast. Now, this week, unfortunately, well, fortunately for Justin, unfortunately for me, he's on vacation and taking a little time off with his family, which we all need to do from time to time. Now, that means that I have the honor of being both the host and the producer this week. So we're trying to record this kind of like it's a live show, but not really. But that way I don't have to spend as much time editing it on the back end. So thank you for your patience. And now let's get on with the show. Today's episode of the All Things MSP podcast is brought to you by superops.ai. Built for future, built for growth. All right, so today I have with me no stranger to the show, no stranger to the channel, uh, Tim Coach from Pia. How you doing, Tim? I'm doing great. I felt like your intro there kind of led into your LinkedIn post today about a work-life balance. Yeah, it. well, you know, it's, it's on the top of mind right now. And uh, yeah, work-life balance is something that I've always kind of struggled with as an MSP, especially when I owned my own business. And I think it's something we've been kind of taught some wrong things about it in the past. And so I'm trying to work out how that uh, works for me in terms of my personal productivity and work-life balance. So, yeah, check it out if you uh, haven't seen everybody, it. Everybody has to, right? It's an important topic, right? Because, I mean, if we talk about our old MSP days, especially when I was the client, what, what I found at MSPs is they would have their, specifically their engineers would come in and just crunch all day long. Then it was like, if you can if you can manage to shove a sandwich down on your way to the client that you're gonna be at till three o'clock in the morning doing whatever forklift you're doing, yep. then I expect you to be back at eight o'clock tomorrow morning to work the desk and the other stuff. It's, it's I'm so glad that we've gone so far. I used to say, we used to, used to grind them into the dirt. I'm so glad we've gone yep. so far away from that kind of a workload. And actually trying to provide a work-life balance for for everybody and helping them to help them understand what that looks like for them. Because some of us of certain generations just don't get that. Like it's right. like rewiring ourselves. Yeah, completely. Because that's not how we grew up in our work lives, right? Yeah, very much. Very much, you know, doing the grind like, you know, you were talking about. And I think... That's kind of a great introduction into what PIA does, right? Because PIA does affect how we work as technicians in an MSP. So Absolutely. for the people who don't know, go ahead and, and give a kind of a 30 second, what is PIA? And uh, then we'll we'll roll into some more details. No, absolutely, because there's so much more to expand on going into 2024. I'm super excited. So essentially what happened is one of the largest MSPs privately owned in Australia was growing rapidly. And what they ran into was, like we all do, help desk really drug them down as far as like earning their money back or getting to ROI or getting to that fable positive EBITDA number, right? So they're like, okay, well, how do we... In essence, how do we, you know, reduce the labor on the help desk? So it turns out they had an extremely smart gentleman working there. They went to him. What do you think we can do here? He's like, I absolutely think I can help with this. And eventually what came out of it was they wrote an enterprise grade AI engine. Now, then, of course, there's, OK, well, I got the engine, but what do I do with the engine? So, and we tell everybody this all the time, right? You come by the booth, you see in my videos, I'll tell you. So basically what we do is we use that AI engine to execute various PowerShell scripts to actually resolve the issue. And I think that's probably the biggest key between what you're seeing and the argument between AI versus RPA is at this point, from what I've seen, we're the only product that actually resolves that issue at the time we're doing it, the software is doing it, right? So the, the AI is taking the action versus the human taking the action. Right. So we, we've wrote it all. It's out there for people to use. We'll get on into how people can manipulate our software to kind of go down that RPA route to justify doing their own stuff. We'll talk about a little bit about that today if you want to. But that's really what it's about. It's really about making that help desk efficient, consistent, and standardized. 
right? Because that's one of the things we talk about too is when you're a young MSP, you know, I, I tell people, you know, the, the profit triangle all the time. When you're an MSP, that base of your triangle is like way out here. It's like, how many things can I do to possibly make money? Right. What you find is you're spread out and your expertise is immensely spread out. But what happens is as you bring the base of that pyramid in, it drives your price up. So you become an expert. So what you're really doing is you're really increasing the cost of your services because you've lowered your, your standardization or not lowered your standardizations. You've, you've scaled down on what you offer and you specialize. So now what it's doing is it's making you an expert because the systems you put in place are handling 85, 90% of the day to day and the rest is managed. So that's when we talk about PIA, that's what we're really talking about is how do we get something that makes the work super efficient, standardizes it and gives a better result for the end customer out of the gate. And the crazy thing about it is you don't have to be technical to do the software, which is what we love. Yeah, well, that's what AI is supposed to do, right? AI is supposed to take those boring, routine, standardized, the robotic process automations and, you know, make them more, you know, accessible to more people. Absolutely. I mean, the, so there's some misconceptions about AI and I wish people would really kind of dig into it instead of just the buzzword, right? Because people hear AI and immediately they all think Skynet, right? We all go to Schwarzenegger right. films and oh my God, it's going to take over. The reality of AI is it is still very much controlled by humans. Yes. Right. And we see those with releases. So so you can go on like YouTube, right, and say, OK, well, I, I want to play the stock market. How can I use AI? Because AI knows everything to play the stock market. Right. And I think the last time I checked, it was like 94 million videos on using AI to play the stock market. The problem is. 4.0, which is what the majority of them are using. I mean, Microsoft and Google, everybody's coming out with their own. Right. 4.0 was released in March of this year. So we're nine months into old data, and we know how much that kills us. The reality of this is those of us that are security conscious are still testing 4.0 to fully engage. And 3.5, which was released in March of last year, is what is currently active in most engines. The point being is humans are controlling the data that are going that's going into those engines. Right. So so if people the more people understand that the, the information they're getting is still by control by humans, perhaps they come a little bit more comfortable with the idea that there's something doing the work instead of the human. We still allow the human to check it because we have to catch up to the technology but it's still humans that are controlling what's actually being put out in the quote unquote AI world. Well, and that's one of the things that really interested me about Pia in the beginning was when you were describing it to me early on, you were talking about how much control the MSP actually has over what the AI does and what the AI doesn't do. Absolutely. I mean, you, you remember the days, right? Anybody that's in an MSP remembers the days, right? You got that one engineer or two engineers that are super hoarding of the work and the knowledge. Right. Right. They don't release that. Well, what we should be doing and what we want to do through standardization is release the AI, taking the knowledge that we have and putting into it and actually allowing it to do the work. So, but once again, it's scary. It's new. We have to allow the humans to catch up. So the way that we've done that is we just put in several breakpoints that's completely, every MSP can adjust at what their own comfortability level. But we put in points where they can do anything from saying go on the next action to all the way through letting the, letting the actual AI fix the ticket, put it in a completed status, and then going through an engineer review process so the engineer can actually look at what it did. But you have to have those breakpoints because the reality is, is we still have to catch up to trusting it. 
Yeah. And in some things, because of the complexity of it and things can go wrong during a mm -hmm. process, we need those breakpoints to be able to check on the different stages of whatever the, the resolution is. And so I think that's that's great that that's what PIA does is allows you to build those in at, again, what you said, at the individual MSP's comfort level. Yeah, the, the customization of the product is, you know, I spent all of 2023 splashing PIA, right? Bring everybody in. Let's let's introduce the topic. Let's have a conversation. Now, 2024 is going to go much more into the logical and the business and the technical aspects of PIA. And, and that's it. It's like you have to give people that control so they build their comfortability up. But I don't say all the time, once you've done 100 password resets. Yeah. You don't want to do you're another one the every time and they're all perfect. Why do another one? Right? right. That's that's literally people don't think about password reset like it is. And there's a ton of people out there that do this kind of stuff. But a password resets about 50 clicks. Mm -hmm. Once you go through the ticket, once you get into the, the client management software, once you go into the password manage to get to right click reset password, that is click, 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 click. And every bit of that is time. Yep. So if I can take that from, let's say you're you're a super efficient engineer and you can do that in 10 minutes. Guess what? I can do it in less than 60 seconds. So I've just saved you nine minutes on a on a repetitive task yeah. that the steps are fairly easy. It just takes time. So I'm yeah. helping to remove all that excess out to actually allow those technical people to focus on the stuff they want to focus on. But at the same time, elating their clients because it's taken care of before they ever get off the phone. How, right. uh, if you remember back to your MSP days, how often in less than five minutes did you fix a ticket with the client still on the phone and they were happy? Yep. And it just, you know, password reset is a perfect example, right? Because that is such a prolific problem. You know, mm -hmm. you get so many help desk tickets per day to do that, uh, that there are purpose built systems out there just to solve that problem. Absolutely. Now, what you guys are doing from what it sounds like is you're taking that model, right? And applying it to other repeatable processes so that you can actually take this even farther. And for the other tickets that are also coming in consistently, be able to apply the same type of logic. Yeah, and people are asking, people are like, okay, well, how do you do that? Well, it's easy. I have a nine-figure MSP that's full of ticket data. Okay, let's let's take the last hundred password reset tickets and figure out what the most efficient way is that we did that, and then let's script it out, and then have the AI run the action versus the human. So now we're becoming faster and freeing up those assets, the people that are more important to the job, but still elating the client that the work's getting done faster. But they, but the, the technician, the person that lives on the phone all day long has a better quality of life. Yep. Um, now, <clears throat> you guys have some statistics on your website that I wanted to go ahead and pull up. Um, you know, 50% reduction in service ticket workload. That's huge. It, it's massive. And what, where it's where we're going to get more into the logic of this year is to better explain these numbers. So 50%. So so our sales process is, is I, I love it personally. And, and I love it from an MSP mindset, not from, I love it from a buyer's mindset. So what we do is we go to, the MSP. We do a discovery, right? It's 30 minutes. All we're doing is seeing if we want to hold hands, right? Hey, I met you. You look all right. We had a great conversation. Let's let's see if we actually fit, if like we're going to be friends. So what I say by doing that is we go in, have a discovery, make sure that they're a fit with us and we're a fit with them because we don't want to lead somebody down the wrong path. The second part of that as we move forward is we actually take a dump of their tickets. So we go out, we get their tickets with their permission, of course. Right. 
And then we run them through our software and we go back to them and say, hey, out of this amount of work that you do, here's the amount that PIA does. And it looks like it's going to save you about this much time. So we do that before there's ever any kind of sales paper in front of them. Then the next part, and this is a critical part, especially now. Once they sign the paperwork, we do the work. We onboard them. So we've all been in those areas where the vendor says, you know what? They're spending $5,000 a month on our product. There is no way they're not going to implement our product. Well, you and I know yeah. that, that, that there's, there's no advantage. They'll pay that $5,000 a month for two years and never implement the product. Unfortunately, yes. But, but they're not getting the benefits of the tool. That's the reason why, you know, and there, there's a lot of things that we pull from the MSP life because we're, we spurred out of an MSP. Right. And a lot of us worked at MSPs. And it's like, if I don't have the time to do it, I'm not going to buy it. So we just took that off the table. We'll implement it for you. And then day one out of the gate, what you'll see is somewhere between 20 and 30% of that help desk. And then over the course of the year, as we're learning more, we'll interact more with that client, depending on what the client wants to feed us. We've seen well in the 50, if not above the 50% range of those repetitive tasks that nobody wants to do. Yeah. And so that's how we get that 50%. And that is important. You know, that, I mean, a lot of places, you know, you, you call it time to revenue, right? In, in this case, it's probably time to efficiency, um, right. you know, in terms of implementing. And you're right. So many MSPs don't implement the tools that they buy because of bad onboarding. And so I, I think it's great that you guys are, are more engaged in making sure that onboarding happens properly. But, but now on the side that we're on now, as the vendor, that makes sense to us. Yeah. It's like, as the vendor, I need to have the responsibility of onboarding these clients because I can guarantee that our clients see ROI, they, sold, they see the tool working functionally the day we sign off on onboarding is done. How many vendors, software packages, whatever it is, is out there that guarantees that? And the reason why I can guarantee it is it's because it's my people doing the onboarding work, it's my people stress testing the MSP software, and it's my people making sure that all the little bits and bobs that got to be adjusted this much and that much for every client is done by the end of onboarding. Yeah. And, you know, you and I could probably have a whole conversation about the effects of customer experience and how that onboarding helps get that customer experience off to, you know, a really good start. Um, but we just don't have time for that today, unfortunately. Um <laughs> And, and then these other statistics lean into what you've already talked about, the eight times faster ticket resolution, the 30% uplift in customer service satisfaction, which is just, you know, a result of that 8x, you know, faster ticket resolution. Mm -hmm. And then this is the one I'd like a little bit more because this is something that's being talked about a lot is because technicians and especially security professionals and things like that are, are such in demand right now. What is this 40% increase in employee retention about? What it narrows down to is it's allowing the people that are technical, right? Like our technicians, we bring you in as a 0.5 or as an intern and a, hopefully we're going to grow you to a God level engineer or a tier three or whatever right. you want to call it. Right. But the problem is, is they get stuck in the mud because there's too much work. Right. People all the time say, I want to be proactive. Yep. Well, you can't be proactive if you can't see the light. So what the software actually does is it allows non-technical people to run the software and still fix the ticket. Because I tell people all the time, I don't care if it's your most knowledgeable tech, <clears throat> excuse me, or it's your grandma they're literally going to get the exact same result out of the ticket every time because we've standardized it 
the AI engine is the one that's executing the scripts and you, you don't need that. So, and that will freeze your technical people up on one side to do the things that they got into tech for, right? right. I want to learn the crazy stuff, you know, security is huge, but it's like, maybe they want to be a security expert. Guess what? I've now freed you up. On the other side of that, what we see is we see people entering the field that are not technical people, but enjoy their job because they're no longer intimidated by the tech, right? So that makes perfect sense. examples of that is one of the testimonies on the website. We got this young lady a little over a year ago. She was a dental receptionist. Nothing wrong with that. It's a good job. That's what she did. Now, though, she went to work for an MSP on average with no technical knowledge she's doing over 42 tickets a day that's crazy and she's doing it running the software so what does that do that means that someone that doesn't necessarily know the bits and bobs doesn't necessarily know the osi model right right where is the problem at most of the time it's chair to keyboard we all know that but the point being is they don't know that but what they're able to do is they're able to advance their career into something that's more sustainable and they're able to perform a job that makes other people happy because you're fixing an issue for them. So they become more satisfied in their career because they're helping people without having to have a whole bunch of knowledge. And then the people that have that crazy OSI level model knowledge is now able to do the things they want to do in their career instead of answering the phone all day long. That's awesome. Yeah, it sounds like what because what can happen quite frequently is you have so much tier one work that your tier one techs can never get out of tier one work. And now you're talking about being able to bring people who are less educated than your tier one starting tech, you know, intern level people and bringing them in and allowing them to do tier one and getting enough tier one stuff done so they can actually progress and learn how to do tier two. And, and it's bringing in people who love to be quality service people. I want to be customer facing. I love the interaction. Yep. Cause guess what? Even though we're not as bad as the old joke of how do you tell an introvert, you know, they're looking at an extrovert introvert from an extrovert. They're looking at your shoelaces, not theirs. Yep. Right. That used to be our field. With mo the, the best way I can put it, we are not there anymore. Our people have advanced, right? but they still like to be in the weeds. This allows them to be in the weeds and it allows the people to be customer facing that want to be customer facing. That's awesome. And, and I think that's very true about what's happening with customer service, with customer experience in this industry. We are having to level up that part of the mm -hmm. game you can no longer just be a good technician. You have to have good people skills as well. Well, and that's the thing is like, think about the ability to take somebody that's a tier one, but a really good people person, right? And you're training them into that next level. But now all of a sudden I have a non-technical dispatcher, which I will always argue for. But now you have a non-technical dispatcher going through all of the mundane pieces of the day because that's what they like. What you've just done is you've taken that one that has the technical knowledge and you've freed them up to actually be in that relationship and actually be a resource for the client. Yeah. We've said for years, we deserve a seat at the table. When they're doing their yearly budgets, we should be there. They shouldn't make any advancements in their business. If they want to grow their business 20%, they have to have us there. Yep. Guess what? We haven't had time to be there. It's products like this that free our people up to be there, to have those conversations because they are trusted because they're the ones that's been fixing those issues every day. Yep. Cause I always tell people, you know, you, the MSP wants the client to be faithful to them. And I hate to break the news, but they're not, they're faithful to the people that save their butt day after day. And when that person goes from saving their butt with password resets and new user logins to, Hey, you know what? You're going to add, you know, you're looking at 10% growth. Your server capabilities, whether cloud or on-prem, are not going to handle that. So we're going to have to look at a couple options to 
so you can pre-plan for the growth. And I'm not coming to you saying, hey, you're going to have to drop another 50, 60 grand a year to allocate for that growth that nobody told you about. So we're actually advancing the technical people to build those relationships with our clients. And we're making our technical people happy so they stay with us. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense in terms of, you're right, we haven't had the time to do those things relationship-wise, which we know are important. We've been telling MSPs for years that it's important, but you're right, there just hasn't been the time. Um, I know that you guys have had a lot of uh, announcements lately, uh, notably your integration with Halo PSA and with uh, LionGuard. So congratulations on those. Um, Thank you. Now, this primarily works from the PSA, correct? Because it integrates with the ticketing. Correct. It, it only works through the PSA. So we can't, we, we can't sell it without the PSA already being involved. Okay. So which PSAs do you guys integrate with at this point? So, so right now, it's ConnectWise, Autotask. Obviously, we announced Halo and then ServiceNow. Now, okay. if you know anything about ServiceNow... That's a giant piece of software and usually pretty massive. So those are the ones that we're integrating with now. We're constantly integrating with more. That's the benefit of the show is when I fill out who I'm talking to, I fill out what their PSA is. Yep. So my, so my engineers know in the background as they're leading that roadmap, hey, who's next in the PSA world that we need to, that we need to connect with, right? It just so happened this last one was, Halo was winning the race, so Halo got yeah. put in. Halo's winning quite a few races recently, so they um, are. They are. Kudos to them. They we actually had them on right. the podcast uh, probably about two or three months ago. In fact, it was right before you guys announced. Yeah, and it's that's the thing is there's so many good tools out there, right? Like I, I was a Connectwise guy for years. So I I love things about Connectwise. I was an Autotask guy for years, and I love things about Autotask, but we have outliers in our industry that don't want to be bleeding edge, but they want to be leading edge. Well, as we looked at the PSAs, Halo's the one that's really got the hammer down quite figuratively and, and quite intentionally. Yep. So it just made sense that they got the call up next. And obviously we'll do more as we're coming along. Yeah. But it was just made sense because that's who the people wanted. So if you're a good vendor, once again, that comes from an MSP background, you'll listen to your clients and you make adjustments based on their needs, not what you think they need. Right. So what is next for PIA? So obviously 2024 is going to be a bane, but we're switching it up this year. I'm switching up the conversations. The conversations need to become more business directed and logic directed, right? So we know everybody loves their choices. So we've released a couple of things here lately to do that. One of those being our smart forms, right? So how do we take more time off of the tech? Well, instead of the tech sitting there filling out the form, right, for whatever the cause is, we've now created smart forms. We white label that. You can send that out to the client. You can actually monetize that in a way that we could talk about. Um, but then the client can sit there and do unlock an account. I need a new user set up. Whatever the scenario is, put that stuff into the into the form. And then when it comes into the system, our AI engine will read that form and automatically integrate it into the ticket and the work being done without any interaction from the human. So once again, we're freeing the human up. The next thing I really love about this thing is we've implemented triage. So we know how time consuming triage can be sit right. down there and work with it so what we've done is we actually have a way that when your customer facing tickets are coming in we'll run all of them automatically through our model and it will automatically triage it and then when the person goes in to fix the ticket the resolution form has already popped up and all they got to do is hit go so now they're not entering in for information we actually have a way using leveraging smart forms and triage together that it will completely automate the entire ticket all the way through. And then currently, once again, because we've got to have that human factor, we got to make the humans comfortable, which we should, right? right? You always got to have checks and balances. 
we'll actually put that in a completed status. And then one of your engineers can go to and do an engineer review every day to say, okay, well, what did it do? How did it do it? Every hour, whatever you choose. But we're still very much putting it in front of the human to know what's going on because you've got to be able to have checks and balances in the system. So now it's not sitting there with an engineer saying, go, go, following the red bouncy ball, you know. Yeah. Now it, here's the form, here's the triage, here's the fix, the work's done. All I'm doing is reviewing and completing it. So those are probably the biggest things. So now we've got full automation. It's not just yeah. a partial automation with what we call engineer assist, which is, you know, following the red bouncy ball next, you know, server 2000 where we had to hit next 20 times, right? Because <clears throat> none of us ever read anything that they put in there. Right. So those are probably the biggest ones we released. And then the thing that's always been there, but I don't, I haven't talked about it a lot. So it's probably, you know, on, on the guy that talks, <laughs> it's probably on his head and his shoulders that people don't know about it. We actually already have it and have always had it built into our system that kind of from that RPA standpoint, like you're interacting with it, you want to write your own stuff. Right. We've always had that integrated. This year, I'm going to be bringing that more forward. I want people to see, yes, we're using AI and it's meant to be automated. However, you know, if you look on our website, we have 60 packages and depending on the package, it's either on-prem, hybrid, or in the cloud, right? So basically three per. But there's people out there that still have things that they need to do. So we're allowing them to either, A, take our package and manipulate it if it makes the best sense for them. Because we have over 300 activities that they can adjust, right. right? Now, it won't overwrite the actual package. It'll add a package because we don't ever want to mess up the source code, right? It's like the old right. firewall days. You get on a firewall, you save the config, you make your changes, you save the kick, config, you put it in the run mode and you kind of hold back. It's like, is it going to work or do I revert? So kind of that same scenario. But we've always had it in there where people can make their own packages. I'm super excited to bring that forward. And there's, like I said, there's 300 activities already. They can manipulate ours. They can create their own. And the best thing that I love about this thing is it is no coding. Like you literally go into, it's the right side of the form. Here's the things that I want to do. Here's the trigger parameters. Here's the activities that I need it to, to, to do based off that. Right. Here's the fix. And once you hit the enter key, all the code automatically writes for you. We've already written all that. Right. So when we say no code, it's literally, you know, you're putting in parameters that any of us would put in, but it's, we have to get past the different version of RMM manipulations yeah. and programming. Yep. Right. That's what the RMM, the RMM did a great job of us being able to go in there and do scripts and do stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We got to move past that. We don't need the RMM. It's all done within the software but allowing people to create their own packages, super easy, and they don't have to know code. All they have to know is what the parameters are looking for. Nice. So if somebody's interested in finding out more about PIA, where do they go? The easiest place to go is to, P is to go to our website, which is PIA.ai. Don't be okay. afraid, we're an Australian-based company. A .ai is real. And right there, it just says sign up for a demo. So. But this is what I want to press. If you're interested, let's have a talk. We're going to have a 30 minute conversation to figure out if we fit because right. we don't want to waste your time because you don't have enough of them. It is. So that's what you're seeing by the statistics. That's what you're seeing by the software. That's what we see by the lack of people to hire. We need to stop wasting time. The vendors need to start being more proactive for the MSPs. So that's how we approach it. How can we make sure that at every step of the way, you're a fit and you're taken care of and you just get to use the product? All right. Thanks, Tim. That was awesome. I'm glad to see that Pia continues to evolve and is really at the forefront, not the bleeding edge necessarily, but the leading edge, like you described it, um, of this incorporating AI and automation into 
the pieces that we haven't seen those things added to yet. Um, thanks very much for joining me today, and uh, hopefully I'll see you out on the road this year. Uh, Eric, as always, it's a pleasure to see you. It's a pleasure to be on the show. I appreciate every minute you give me because I know your time is just as valuable as some of those technicians. <laughs> well, I am kind of burning the candle at both ends, but I'm having fun doing it. Uh, you got to have fun, right? Yep. Work that. Let's go back to the first of the show. Work-life balance. You That's gotta right. have fun. You gotta have fun. Yep. All right. Well, I'm gonna close this out, and uh, I'll come back and talk to you in just a second. All right. Hey, everybody! Thanks again for watching another All Things MSP podcast. I promise Justin will be back for the next one, um, leaving me free to do more production stuff on the back end. But until next time. Have a great one. And as Justin is very fond of saying, we'll try and do better next time. See ya. And don't forget our sponsor for this episode, superops.ai, the AI-powered PSA RMM platform designed for fast-growing MSPs. Built for future, built for growth. From your host, Justin Escar, and myself, thank you for listening to the All Things MSP podcast. Join the All Things MSP Facebook group or follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube. The All Things MSP podcast is a BizPow LLC production, and even though we drink a lot of it, this podcast is still not sponsored by Liquid Death. And now that you've watched that mess of a podcast, don't forget to watch one of these and go ahead and click that subscribe button so you get to watch more. Yeah, just go ahead and do it. Click the button and then watch one of the other videos. I'm watching.